West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Well, Senator Patrick Leahy, he has seen it all, and he's never seen anything like what he saw today in the Senate Judiciary Committee. Senator Leahy is the longest-serving member of the current Senate. He is the longest-serving member of the Judiciary Committee. He is a former chairman of the Judiciary Committee. He has attended more Supreme Court confirmation hearings than anyone else in the Senate. And he was outraged by what he saw in the hearing this morning when Republican Lindsey Graham violated the time limit on senators speaking, not by a minute or two, which is common, but by a full 10 minutes in addition to the 20 minutes that each senator was allowed to speak. And in those 10 minutes, Lindsey Graham launched a raged-filled rant. That's an abrogation of everything the Senate should stand for. Uh, you had a Republican member who went way over the time allotted to him, uh, ignored the rules of the committee, badgered the nominee, would not even let her answer the questions. Uh, that, that I've never seen anything like that. I've been here 48 years. Here we have a highly respected and respectable nominee and to be treated that way. I, I don't know what the motivation might be, or what political motivation it is, but to see the badgering of this woman uh, as she's trying to testify, I thought was outrageous. Pat Leahy has never seen anything like it, and I have never seen Pat Leahy so outraged. Lindsey Graham voted for for Judge Katanji Brown Jackson last year in her confirmation to the second most important court in the country, the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. Every single objection that Lindsey Graham raised today to Judge Jackson's record was in her record when Lindsey Graham voted to confirm her last year without saying a word about those issues. Chairman Dick Durbin may have allowed Lindsey Graham to seize control of the hearing for 10 full minutes in violation of the rules because the chairman hopes that by indulging Lindsey Graham, he can win Lindsey Graham's vote once again for Katanji Brown Jackson. Doesn't look like that's going to happen, but if it does happen, which extremes, seems extremely unlikely, then Chairman Durbin did the right thing today. Anything for a vote. Dick Durbin is the chairman of the Judiciary Committee because Democrats lost confidence in 88-year-old Dianne Feinstein's ability to run hearings like this, and so the Democratic leadership pushed Dianne Feinstein aside in favor of 77-year-old Dick Durbin. Now, the ability to run a hearing is not based on age, as Senator Patrick Leahy showed when he jumped in to show Dick Durbin how to shut down interruptions from Republican senators. 
10 senators on this committee are asking the chairman, Mr. chairman to provide those reports so we can do what Judge Jackson Mr. just chairman, said, I, which I, is I to assess the, those reports. And Mr. here is chairman, the letter. I, I, know I ask ju- unanimous I know the consent junior to be admitted senator, to the record. I know the junior senator from Texas likes to get on television, but most of us have been here a long time trying to follow the rules. Uh, and he could very easily hand you a letter to go in the record. He's saying he's doing this to help uh, Senator Hawley. Senator Hawley could have put it in, and he didn't. Yeah. But let's get back to regular Senator order. Hawley didn't write the letter. Mr. Let's Chairman, I asked unanimous consent. Republicans spent the day saying they don't think the prison sentences that Judge Jackson gave to defendants who possessed child pornography were long enough. Lindsey Graham said that the lightest sentence Judge, Jack- Judge Jackson gave, which was three months, should have been 50 years. That's it. That's what the Republicans spent the day saying. Something that took me less than a minute to say just now. But it is literally a one sentence objection that they have to Judge Jackson. It can be spoken in one sentence. They don't think her sentences for possession of child pornography were long enough. Her sentences were within the norm for federal judges around the country. But these Republican senators don't believe those sentences were long enough. None of them, other than Lindsey Graham, said how long any of those sentences should have been. The potential candidates for president on the committee spent the day interrupting Judge Jackson, not allowing her to finish answers, and Senator Tom Cotton said he did not believe one of her answers. He was accusing Judge Jackson of lying under oath. Republicans were treating the hearing as they do every event that has cameras as a campaign fundraising event, and through it all, Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson persevered. She learned how to persevere when facing challenges a long time ago. Cory Booker is one of the most bipartisan Democratic senators. He publicly refers to Republicans by name as friends. He publicly compliments some Republican senators. And when he his turn came today, Cory Booker had no questions, really. He just offered an extraordinary, extemporaneous set of remarks in which he commended Judge Jackson for climbing the mountain she climbed to be now just one step away from the top of the judicial mountain in the United States. We will bring you most of what Senator Booker had to say later in this hour. We're just going to roll that videotape later and let you see that moment that first brought Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson to tears today, tears of appreciation for the people who Senator Booker said made this day possible. But that wasn't the last time that Judge Jackson fought back tears today. The junior senator from California, Alex Padilla, is the second most junior Democratic member of the committee. And so he always speaks toward the end of the hearings. Alex Padilla's parents came to California from Mexico and watched their son go off to college on the other side of the country at MIT, the most selective science-oriented university in the world. He told Judge Jackson today that Just as she was discouraged by some from applying to Harvard, he was discouraged by one of his high school teachers from applying to MIT. And then he asked her what she says to young people who doubt that they can achieve what she has achieved. I hope to inspire people to try to follow um, this path because I love this country. because I love the law. (laughs) Because I think it is important that we all invest in our future. And the young people are the future. And so I want them to know that they can do and be anything And I'll just say that um, I will tell them what uh, an anonymous person said to me once. I was walking through Harvard Yard my freshman year. As I mentioned, I went to uh, public school and I didn't know anything about Harvard until um, my debate coach took me there to enter a speech competition and I thought this is a great university it was basically one of the only ones I'd seen and I said maybe I'll apply when I'm a senior but 
I get there and whoa, <laughs> so different. I'm from Miami, Florida. Boston is very cold. Um, it was um, it was rough. It was different from anything I'd known. There were lots of students there who were um, prep school kids like my husband <laughs> um, who knew all about <laughs> <laughs> knew all about Harvard and, and that was not not me and I think the first semester I was really homesick I was really questioning um, do I belong here can I can I make it in this environment and I was walking through the yard in the evening and a black woman I did not know was passing me on the sidewalk and she looked at me and I guess she knew how I was feeling and she leaned over as we crossed and said persevere I would tell them to persevere it is Thursday the 24th of March of 2022 and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner, the English Bulldog, is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya. A little bit of spice in your life. And don't we need it? Um, yes. Uh, Judge Jackson's uh, confirmation hearing was indeed treated like a campaign fundraiser uh, by the repu repugs on the committee. And I'll tell you why. Because it was a campaign fundraiser for them. They uh, will be slicing and dicing the clips up for their own nefarious uh, reasons. And we know what those reasons are. So I'm still appalled that insurgents insurrectionists fist bumping seditionists are allowed to be on the judiciary committee let alone elected office all right well uh speaking of which if you run for elected office and you are part of a presidential commission that is a violation of the hatch act and you have to stop being on that presidential commission otherwise you're terminated Emmett or Mehmet Oz and Herschel. Yeah. So get out. If you're running for office, get out. All right. You know, the Hatch Act was violated so many times over the four years of Trump that it was considered to be just, I don't know, one of those little minor inconveniences that we have to report because nothing was done about it. And even when they tried to do something about it, they couldn't. Sort of like what's happening with the Manhattan DA. <laughs> yeah. Somebody put a horse's head in that guy's bed. Woke up and went, oh my God, that's my favorite horse. And he doesn't even own horses. But it was enough to scare the shit out of him. You know, when you're made an offer you can't refuse, you can't refuse. No matter what it looks like. And you know what it looks like? It looks like exactly what it is. Pomerantz is not some junior prosecutor with with a, uh, a a peak ambitions for greater things. He's already done greater things. He quit because they had multiple felonies they were going to charge Trump with, or should I say, he resigned. Multiple felonies, and Bragg said, "No, nah, there's not enough there." And Bragg had just been elected and put into office. All right. First you had uh, Vance. All right. Now you got Bragg. So, are there two kinds of justice in America, judiciary? I, there's only one kind of justice when it comes to me. I am what I am. But there are, actually, I think there's not two kinds of justice in our judiciary. I think there's a few different kinds of justices. Or justice. 
Um, and when it comes to Trump, it seems to be that that guy gets away with it a lot, doesn't he? Mm hmm. The corruption that has manifested through these many decades, I think, tracks quite nicely with the rise of the Heritage Foundation, the Federalist Society, ALEC, and the entrenchment of dark money groups in the form of corporate America, who for some reason tax towards the fascists, just like the Nazis and fascists of old. They would not have been able to survive if it had not been for big business. When you hear Burgermeister, think of all those McMansions in the Yorba Linda Hills, for instance. Okay? That's what we're talking about. That is how fascism gets its foot in the door, and the people don't want to give up their things. And their things are much more important than the gossamer thin idea of representative democracy, which takes an agreement among individuals to live in a community and to make decisions as a community. The repugs do not want us in their community because we are subhuman and who are we? We are liberals, Democrats. We have no right to rule. That's why they do the things they do. Now, if we were to turn the tables back on that, would that mean that we become like them? I know the argument. But, you know, they can't even handle equality right now. Equality to them means that they are lesser. If someone, quote, lesser is raised to their level, they are not equal anymore. They are only equal if they can dominate. I don't know how that works in terms of logic, but it works for them. Always has, and it looks like it always will. This vaunted comity that we are supposed to adhere to in our government is non-existent. When the other side considers us to be such subhumans that they can just change the law on a whim. Conservative majority on the Supreme Court in their shadow docket throughout Wisconsin's maps. And yet just weeks before, they said, oh, no, we can't do this one for this other state because it's too close to the election. They told Wisconsin to go back to the drawing board right before the election. In both cases, the decision helped the entrenched white party at the expense of American citizens who happened to be of color. And then we have to hear these insurgent, seditious, insurrectionists. How many can I get in that one sentence? On the Judiciary Committee, talk about politicization. Granting protective rights to trans kids is making the world political. Well, damn right. If there's an inequity... Uh, uh, put upon a group, they redress their government, and their government responds. And the government responded and said, stop being such bigots. And the argument on the other side is that I have a deeply held religious belief to be a bigot. And you can't, enter it. You can't uh, 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 stop me from being religious. It's my faith. Well, that's why we have a separation of church and state, you idiot. There's no religious test here. I don't care what Marsha Blackburn says about her deeply held religious belief. We know what hypocrites they are. I'm telling you. I asked Anonymous 
to hack the hard drives of these repug judiciary committee members to see what kind of child porn they have on their computers. They seem to be very, very, very involved in it. I mean, Judge Jackson's elderly parents, they're not that elderly, but, you know, because we're, we're pretty old ourselves now. But for all intents and purposes, her elderly parents and her daughters are in the committee room. And the repugs give the most graphic descriptions of child rape and sex and porno images. And I'm like, what the hell? I've been around the block a few times and I've, I, don't, I really don't want to hear this. Not something I go around imagining. Why are they? I'll tell you why. Projection be thy name. And it seems to prove itself out, too, when you look at uh, the court dockets for a lot of pedophilia going on in America today. Who are they? If you want to look at religious groups who find justifications for it, they seem to be represented quite well on the Supreme Court. Amy, I'm looking at you. Is that a scurrilous charge? I don't think so. Look into it. When you live or exist in a patriarchy, the patriarchy tells you what is polite. You break. So, the repugs on the Judiciary Committee doubled down on their disrespect. And they can do it because she's a black lady. And as soon as she gets angry, she'll be an angry black lady. And that's the worst kind of black lady to have in America because they're all angry, you know. All soft on crime, unless they're a cop. First, everybody was whining, oh, Kamala's a cop. Now Judge Jackson's like a, a criminal advocate. She's advocating crime because she defended criminals. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Innocent until proven guilty. One of those liberal niceties that we can do away with now. Well, do we have to take it? Just because we have <laughs> for all this time. Oh, no, no. I Granted, we stood up. Uh, friends got their heads bashed in on the Danziger Bridge. You know, what do we do? Well, some of us got mad enough to do something about it for a little while. Okay. Um, yes, we do have our work cut out for us. And it's Thursday already with the weekend coming up. Joe's in Europe right now for this emergency NATO summit. Um, my prediction is that uh, I think that they're going to be quietly mobilizing troops and material because I think they have it on the uh, low low. That uh, doubling down to Putin doesn't mean doubling down on just Ukraine. He's got designs for world domination and has for quite some time because that's the only way to raise Russia back up to its vaunted level of greatness. Okay. And that cannot happen. The guy's a dictator. Okay. I know that there are many here, like the Coke company, the Coke brother company, not necessarily Coca-Cola, but they're involved too. But I'm talking about the Cokes and others who have no qualms about doing business with an entity, a state who has declared war on us. You know, there used to be a word for companies and individuals who did that. And there were ramifications for it. Well, I guess we can work to make sure there are ramifications for it. And I keep telling everybody, there's a Nuremberg in Pennsylvania. It's the perfect spot for the trials. 
we're talking about war crimes. That would be interesting. Let's bring Vlad over here for a Nuremberg trial in Nuremberg, PA. And then we can get all of his henchmen up there, too. Who's going to be wearing the sunglasses like Goering did? Or was it Goebbels? Goering. All right. What's on the rest of the menu here? Rant is over. No, it's not. <laughs> we'll, we'll just repurpose it for the rest of the show. What's on the rest of the menu here as we begin this fine Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays? The Biden administration announced an initiative to address racial bias in home appraisals. Yeah, you don't want to be black and have your home appraised, and you don't want to have a, any black art in your house when it's being appraised. It will be appraised very, very low. Republicans made sure the IRS Criminal Investigation Unit got no funds to enforce sanctions on rich Russians. How convenient. And Madeleine Albright fled the Nazis as a child and climbed to the summit of diplomacy and foreign policy in the United States. Rest in peace, great woman. After the break, we move to the chef's table where, crushed by war, the Russian stock market will partially reopen for limited trading. Oh, remember to buy your petrol in rubles. And the Taliban broke their promise on higher education for Afghan girls. And you can thank Mike Pompeo for that. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. At netrootsradio.com, to the right of the page is the chat room link, and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. And, uh, by the way, uh, Netroots Nation, this year, in person, in Pittsburgh, back where it all started. Well, almost. But anyway, uh, Kelly's getting her press passes, and we're going to have our presence on Radio Row, even though that doesn't exist anymore. But uh, so look forward to Kelly doing some more yeoman work at this year's Netroots Nation. So stay tuned for that. Thank you, Kelly. Across the page from the chat room link uh, to the left near the bottom of our homepage at NetrootsRadio.com is the link to our Patreon page. And could you send us what you might spend on an espresso type coffee drink uh, once a month? That would really help us pay our bills and uh, fly under the radar as we have been doing for the last 11 years of 24-7, 365 Continuous Resistance Broadcast Radio. And we have been able to do that because of your generosity. And I got to be honest, uh, we we need it and more of it from more of you. <laughs> so... Don't let just a few take on the burden. And uh, we dig deep into our wallets, too. And uh, But we need the help that we can get from you folks as well. So thank you for the help, and thank you in the future for help in the future. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that, and we love the fact that Tom does that for us. And everything else. <laughs> thank you, Tom. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime. And then I try to get that posted up on Twitter and those other social media platforms. You know who they are. Follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West. And please do pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc., 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 wherever, wherever podcasts can be found. And, of course, the deep archive of not only 
West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, but all of the Netroots radio produced shoes, shows over these so many years can be found uh, at the Internet Archive at archive.org. Look for the Netroots Radio Library. All righty. This uh, first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is Out of the American Independent by the great Oliver Willis. On Wednesday, that was yesterday, the Biden administration announced a new initiative designed to combat the effects of racism in the process of home appraisal. Experts say disparities in the results of appraisals based on racial bias are widespread and have led to the loss of billions of dollars in value for black communities. The action plan was released by the Interagency Task Force on Property Appraisal and Valuation Equity, co-chaired by Housing and Urban Development Secretary Marsha Fudge and White House Advisor Susan Rice, who is the director of the U.S. Domestic Policy Council. Under the plan... Multiple government agencies will work in concert to increase oversight of the property appraisal industry, as well as create a federal rule aimed at setting a non-discrimination quality control standard as part of a forthcoming proposed rule establishing quality control standards on automated valuation models known as AVMs. And that's used in determining home values. The plan also calls for the expansion of complaint hotlines at HUD and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau for use by consumers as part of, of, quote, concrete efforts to empower homeowners and home buyers on effective steps they can take when they receive a valuation that is lower than expected, end quote. The task force wasn't announced by President President Joe Biden on the 1st of June of 2021 in a speech marking 100 years since the Tulsa race massacre, during which the affluent black neighborhood of Greenwood in Tulsa was attacked, looted and burned by white mobs. Biden said the task force was part of the expanded efforts targeted toward black wealth creation that will also help the entire community. Wait until the repugs hear about this. This is critical race theory gone crazy. Everything's so woke. They use it because they really want to use the N-word, don't they? A 2021 study by the Federal Home Loan Mortgage Corporation, otherwise known affectionately as Freddie Mac, of appraisals issued between 2015 and 2021 found that bias in home appraisals was pervasive and system, systemic, <laughs> systematically led to, or I'm sorry, systemically led to substantially lower home values within black and Latino communities. Junia Howell, who teaches sociology at the University of Illinois in Chicago, told Bloomberg, Individual bias is definitely affecting these things, but it's actually a structural issue. Across different appraisers who have different backgrounds in different counties, we're seeing this inequality across the board, really demonstrating that it is deeply embedded in the ways and methods of appraising. Uh, let's see, Car- Carlet Duffy, a black woman living in Indianapolis, filed complaints against mortgage companies with HUD in May of 2021, alleging discrimination, discrimination on the basis of race. After her home was appraised at 125 and 110,000 bucks, Duffy took steps to conceal her race from the next appraiser including hiding photos of herself and her family and enlisting a white friend to pose as her brother when the appraisal was being made. The third appraiser valued the home at 259000 bucks, more than double the original estimated value. Now, the Biden administration is making other efforts to address systemic racism in the U.S., including provisions in the recently enacted Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that seeks to undo 
racist decisions embedded in past road and neighborhood planning. Hussein of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. For all of the talk about slapping sanctions on Russian oligarchs, there was a notable omission in the Ukraine aid package approved this month by Congress. An infusion of money for the IRS criminal investigation arm tasked with tracking down the pricey properties of the Russian elite did not make the cut. The White House request to give the IRS a measly $30 million for tracing financial activities associated with sanctioned people appeared to run afoul of broader reluctance by Republicans to put more money into IRS enforcement actions. Republicans close to the spending bill negotiations said the mission of the IRS should be to administer and enforce the U.S. tax code, not to enforce sanctions. Well, you would expect that since the Republican Party has been bought uh, pretty wholly by Russia. We must remember how much NRA money flowed through the Republican Party for many election cycles. And then we find out the NRA had been inf infiltrated by Russian spies. How is it that the Republican platform was changed during the convec convention, pretty much in secret, to Russia's benefit? So you would expect them to monkey wrench this bill. Many of the sanctions levied on Russia's elite and its central bank are imposed by the Treasury Department and its various enforcement arms, including those at the IRS. Along with the newly formed Klepto Capture Group led by the Justice Department, the IRS plays a major role in imposing sanctions on oligarchs and supporters of Putin. A lack of funding for the IRS Criminal Investigations Unit damages the ability of our law enforcement community to do its work, said Danny Glasser, a former Treasury Assistant Secretary for Terrorist Financing and Financial Crimes. The IRS criminal investigations, he said, are some of the best financial investigations in the world. It is important that they are at full strength. In his funding, request to Congress... The White House said the measly 30 million bucks would expand IRS criminal investigations capability to find links between various businesses, conduct digital asset training, and identify the ownership of assets owned by oligarchs and others linked to Putin. And the Republicans voted it down because they know they would be caught up in this investigation. Part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy comes out of the Associated Press by Matthew Lee. 
Madeleine Albright fled the Nazis as a child and climbed to the summit of diplomacy and foreign policy in the United States, breaking the glass ceiling as the first female Secretary of State and setting the pace for other women to follow. Albright, whose family said she had died on Wednesday yesterday of cancer at age 84, was the daughter of a Czech diplomat who was and was born just as Hitler's Germany started to move down a path of conquest. The bleak years that followed uprooted Albright's family and intimidated Europe. Sounds familiar now, doesn't it? She grew to be outspoken and advised women years later to, quote, act in a more confident manner and to ask questions when they occur and don't wait to ask, end quote. It took me a long time to develop a voice, and now that I have it, I am not going to be silent, Albright told Huffington Post in 2010. Her determination to use her academic background and her instinct for world affairs, combined with a formidable drive, led her to become the first woman to head the State Department. She was not part of the presidential line of succession, however, because of her birth outside of the United States. For decades, Albright was a popular professor at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service, where her modern foreign government, governments was a required course and examined autocracies and the rise and fall of nation states, including in Ethiopia, the Czech Republic and the Soviet Union. A scholar influenced heavily by the Cold War, she also took a profound interest in arms control and was a proponent of combating dictatorships. An internationalist, Albright was shaped in part by her background as a refugee. She played a key role in persuading Clinton to go to war against the Yugoslav leader Slobodan Milosevic over his brutal treatment of Kosovar Albanians in 1999. My mindset is Munich, she said frequently referring to the German city where the Western Allies, in 1938, abandoned her homeland to the Nazis. She enjoyed her reputation for plain speaking, and she turned her love of, of jewelry into a weapon, telegraphing her messages with the brute she chose to war, called a snake by the Iraqi government under Saddam Hussein, she boarded a snake pin during a U.N. debate on Iraq. When devious, I wear a spider, she said. When ready to sting, a bee. Rest in peace, Grand Lady. All right, that brings us to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. This is Scientific American 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. Within a few decades, global temperatures are expected to climb to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. And that's going to be really bad for corals, according to the latest report out from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So the recent IPCC report says that up to 1.5, we can expect 10 to 30 percent coral survivorship and above that, it decreases precipitously. Andrea Gratoli is a distinguished professor at The Ohio State University. Amid the doom and gloom of the IPCC report, Gratoli has some rare good news. Corals may be more adaptable to future conditions than we thought. Her team studied three species of coral from the island of Oahu in Hawaii. They put them in tanks with either heat stress, more acidic water, or both. And what really matters in this study is the one where both increases in temperature and ocean acidification, because that's exactly what's happening on reefs now. 22 months later, they assessed the winners and losers, and they found that on average, more than half the corals survived, even after being punished with those warmer, more acidic waters, the kind they'd face under two degrees of global warming. The corals 
that survived, two of the three species were actually physiologically performing normally. They were doing more than surviving, right? They were coping, they'd acclimatized, they were doing well. The results appear in the journal Scientific Reports. Gratoli says the study provides hope the world's corals may be more resilient than we thought, especially since one of the Hawaiian species they studied is widespread around the planet. But will this good news motivate world leaders to actually rein in warming? Well, corals may be able to wait just a little longer to find out. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to NetrootsRadio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetrootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. Right-wing Republicans and corporate Democrats have become a pathetic bunch of no-can-do Nancys. Faced with an economy reeling from the plutocratic policies that these same lawmakers push down upon us, they are now whimpering that America is too weak to meet the obvious needs of its own people. We must surrender to the gods of economic despair, they cry. At a time when history calls for our leaders to step forth with a bit of FDR boldness and rally grassroots people to rebuild our economy, they trumpet for retreat, giving up on America's historic ideal of the common good. A jobs program? Everyone for themselves, they shout. Health care for all? Go to the emergency room, they scream. Social security? Socialism, they screech. Run away from it. Public education? Can't afford it, they tell us, as they turn their backs on hundreds of thousands of teachers soon to be fired. Repair America's rotting infrastructure? Too big for us, they wail. Leave it to the next generation. Wagging tea bags rather than picking up the tools of real recovery, the woeful voices of American failure insist that they speak for the people. Hogwash. Americans are a strong, community-minded, democratic-spirited, can-do people. Indeed, the latest Gallup poll shows that 60% of the public favors, quote, additional government spending to create jobs and stimulate the economy. But we must balance the budget, whine the naysayers. Of course we should, and big majorities say we should do that by putting people to work, taxing the super-rich to pay their fair share of Social Security and other public needs, as well as by slashing the $12 billion a month we're spending for wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. This is Jim Hightower saying, it's time for these so-called leaders to stop whining and catch up to the people. Elizabeth Cady Stanton was one of the chief organizers of the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention, the first convention in the United States dedicated exclusively to women's rights. She also wrote the Declaration of Sentiments, the seminal document of the women's movement that set the agenda for the movement for years to come. Like so many other women's rights activists of her era, she first became involved in the abolitionist movement. Stanton attended the 1840 World Anti-Slavery Convention in London, where she met Lucretia Mott. The two decided to organize a women's rights convention in the United States in part because they had been barred from fully participating in the London Convention, being relegated to simply watch the proceedings on account of their gender. Over the years, Stanton collaborated with Susan B. Anthony, and the pair wrote prolifically, making a lasting impact on the women's movement. Both Stanton and Anthony advocated for extending the right to vote to women with the 15th Amendment, and were disappointed when it did not. In response, they formed the National Woman Suffrage Association in 1869. Elizabeth Cady Stanton is remembered for her persuasive oratorical skills, the power of her writing, her tireless advocacy of the right to vote for women, and reform of laws that kept men and women on an unequal footing. This has been 60 Second Civics, a podcast of the Center for Civic Education. 
I'm Mark Gage. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1974. It was the final day of a groundbreaking gathering of more than 3,000 women union members in Chicago to found the Coalition of Labor Union Women, or CLU. The union women had come together for the purpose of increasing their voice in the labor movement. Women from 58 unions and 41 states joined the conference. Nearly 2,000 of the attendees were rank-and-file members. For many of them, the Chicago gathering was their first major labor conference. They heard a keynote address by Addie Wyatt. Addie Wyatt was the first African-American woman to hold a top office in an American labor union. She was elected vice president of her meatpacking local in 1953. Addie's speech inspired the women. They chose her to serve as the first Clue vice president. They selected Olga Mater as president of Clue. Olga had entered the United Auto Workers Union at the Ford Willow Run bomber plant during World War II. She became the first woman to serve on the UAW executive board. With these two seasoned labor activists at the helm, Clue became an important force in U.S. labor. The women attending the founding convention agreed on four key goals. First was to promote affirmative action in the workplace. Second was to strengthen the role of women in unions. Third, to organize the unorganized women. And their final objective was to increase the involvement of women in the political and legislative process. Since its founding, Clue has supported efforts for pay equality, parental leave, and child care. Today, Clue continues to encourage and mentor future women labor leaders and works to involve more women in the political process. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, and follow us on the Twitters at Labor History in Two. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays. We always begin, whether from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River and the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 52 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high in the mid-70s again, which was pretty nice yesterday. Will be partly to mostly cloudy throughout the day, and winds will be light and variable, as they will tonight with some clouds passing through. Lows will be in the mid 40s, and then some sunshine and clouds mixed tomorrow with highs in the low 70s. Winds will remain light and variable. Confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County in the southern part of Oregon have risen as expected. Even though we're taking off our masks, they still rise. Confirmed cases are now standing at 424,087 infections confirmed and deceased have risen by three and we now stand at 503 dead. Oh, here's some good news. Pollen is rated as none right outside the window here in Rogue River proper and the air quality index for the region is good at 26 parts per million, but the daytime UV index is is moderate and has ticked up even another level to level five. Barometric pressure is rising at 30.16 inches. Visibility is at six miles and relative humidity is at 80%. We're expecting some rain uh, towards uh, the weekend, so the end of the weekend. So we'll see how that goes. Hey, I was able to get weather from around the world to work on the weather underground. I would made uh, a new account. I don't know why they made me make a new account, but I made a new account. And all of my favorites would not stick. So I had to log out as just a visitor. And now all of my favorites are sticking. 
as an anonymous visitor. Who knew? Well, weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 66 and sunny. Paris is 69 and sunny. Rome is 67 and fair. Kiev is 45 and mostly cloudy. Kabul is 53 and clear. Hong Kong is 66 and mostly cloudy with heavy wind. Tokyo is 47 and clear. Sydney, Australia is 65 and cloudy. San Francisco, California is 47 and partly cloudy. And New York, New York is 42 degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Associated Press staff bring us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The Russian stock market opened today, Thursday, for limited trading under heavy restrictions for the first time since Moscow invaded Ukraine, coming almost a month after prices plunged and the market was shut down as a way to insulate the economy. Trading of a limited number of stocks, including energy giants Gazprom and Rosneft, took place under curbs meant to prevent a repeat of the massive sell-off on February 24th that came in anticipation of Western economic sanctions. The significant restrictions on trading underlying Russia's economic isolation and the pressure the financial system is under despite central bank efforts to curb market plunges. Foreigners could not sell and traders were barred from short selling while the government has said it will spend $10 billion on shares in coming months, a move that should support prices. A U.S. official called the severely restricted market a charade, with only some listed shares trading and Russia making it clear it would pour government resources into artificially propping up the shares of companies that are trading. This is not a real market and not a sustainable model, which only underscores Russia's isolation from the global financial system. Dalip Singh, a deputy national security and economic advisor to President Joe Biden, said in a statement. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Kathy Gannon of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Afghanistan's Taliban rulers unexpectedly decided against reopening schools yesterday, Wednesday, to girls above the sixth grade, reneging on a promise and opting to appease their hardline base at the expense of further alienating the international community. The surprising decision, confirmed by a Taliban official, is bound to disrupt efforts by the Taliban to win recognition from potential international donors at a time when the country is mired in a worsening humanitarian crisis. The international community has urged Taliban leaders to reopen schools and give women their right to 
public space. The reversal was so sudden that the education ministry was caught off guard on Wednesday yesterday, the start of the school year, as were schools in parts of the Afghan capital of Kabul and elsewhere in the country. Some girls in higher grades returned to schools only to be told to go home. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver